Hi, uh, my name is Joshua Thurman. I'm from the University of Colorado. And what I want to talk about today is the role of the complement pathway in IgA nephropathy and how that factors into the treatment uh, pipeline. Here are my disclosures. And the objective for this session is to recognize how some novel IgA nephropathy treatments exert their effects on the complement pathway and then the anticipated side effects of this uh, class of medications based on their mechanism of action. In the outline of what I'll discuss is um, to review the complement system, how it is activated in glomerular disease, the downstream mechanisms of complement mediated injury, data that um, indicates that complement activation is or is not pathogenic in IgA nephropathy, uh, review some of the complement therapeutics and how they are different from other immunomodulatory drugs, and then I'll offer some ideas about what is the best anti-complement drug for IgA nephropathy and review some of the ongoing trials right now. And then finally, uh, discuss how to fit complement inhibitors into the treatment regimens that incorporate other uh, drugs that are currently used for IgA nephropathy. So first, I want to start with the polling question. Uh, the question is this. When you detect glomerular C3 deposits in biopsies from patients with IgA nephropathy, um, what best describes them? Are they A, rarely seen, B, due to nonspecific trapping of uh, the protein C3 in the expanded mesangium, C, pathognomonic for IgA vasculitis, or D, prognostically important? Many of you have already seen this uh, current model for the pathophysiology of IgA nephropathy, and it is based on a uh, four-hit model of how um, aberrantly glycosylated um, IgA is produced. Patients then develop antibodies to this. Uh, the immune complex is deposited in the mesangium, and then these uh, deposited immune complexes trigger complement activation, causing glomerular injury. And when you think about the role of the complement system um, uh, in this model, it really fits into this HIT-4. It is a downstream um, mediator of glomerular injury um, that uh, probably is activated after these other three hits have um, already uh, been engaged. So this is just one portion of the injury, and as I said, it's a, a downstream phenomenon. So as we think about complement and how it may fit into IgA nephropathy, it's worth reviewing what the complement cascade is. Many of you have seen the very complicated pictures with uh, components of the cascade, with the names that are very hard to remember. And this is my simplistic um, uh, outline of the cascade. And it is that this uh, system is activated by one of three pathways, the classical, the lectin, or the alternative pathways. All three of these, once engaged, lead to the cleavage and fixation of C3 on the target tissue. So if you activate any of these pathways, they can produce the down, uh, same downstream effects. The proteins that are involved in activation of the cascade um, uh, by these different pathways differ, however. And when we think of immune complex or antibody-driven uh, glomerular disease, we're usually thinking of the classical pathway, which is activated by IgG and IgM. The lectin pathway also involves C4. And then the alternative pathway, which has emerged as an important pathway in a number of kidney diseases, um, does not involve immunoglobulin and does not uh, involve C4. And this is a, a pattern of activation that we see in some diseases. And in all of these, as I said, generate the same downstream fragments and all of them lead to fixation of C3 fragments uh, to the glomerulus. Now, one of the conundrums about IgA nephropathy is that IgA itself does not activate the classical pathway. And this distinguishes it from some other immune complex diseases. And so the question has been, how then does complement get activated in this disease? And there are a couple of possible explanations. One is that if uh, there's an old study that showed that aggregated IgA can directly activate the alternative pathway, so you may not need classical pathway activation. Just by depositing this in the glomerulus, you may get alternative pathway activation. The other observation is that even though we think of um, IgA as the immuno, is the dominant deposit in IgA nephropathy, many, if not most patients, also have IgG deposits in the glomerulus. So that could, of course, um, activate the classical pathway through the traditional mechanisms that we think of in uh, glomerular nephritis. Either way, it does appear that um, C3 is deposited in most, if not all, cases of IgA nephropathy. 
This is a nice table that was in uh, Hepkinsall's Pathology of the Kidney a couple of years ago, summarizing a number of different clinical studies showing that um, between 90 and 100 percent of the biopsies analyzed had C3 deposits. So again, regardless of whether it's classical or alternative pathway, all pathways lead to C3, and you almost always see these deposits in IgA nephropathy, showing that the complement system is activated. Once complement is activated, we may stain for C3, but you're simultaneously generating a number of different fragments that have potent biologic effects. So for example, if you're generating C3A and C5A, these uh, ligate receptors on neutrophils and other immune cells, the kidney can also express receptors for these fragments, so they can have direct effects on cells within the kidney, including podocytes. Uh, C3B, which we stain for, um, also is a ligand for receptors on leukocytes, so this too has a lot of immunologic effects. And then finally, the downstream terminal complement fragments, the membrane attack complex, forms pores in target cells, which can activate them or lead to direct uh, lysis of target cells. So this is what happens when complement is activated, but is there specific evidence that complement activation is pathogenic and plays a role in IgA nephropathy? Really, most of what we have is indirect associative evidence. So here's a study uh, published a couple of years ago where the authors looked at the deposition of C1Q, which is a classical pathway protein in IgA nephropathy, and what the authors found is that when they could see C1Q deposits, renal survival uh, was worse than if they did not see those deposits. But one of the interesting things about this study is that they only saw the C1Q in a small subset of patients, about 14% of the patients. So it seems like C1Q deposition or classical pathway activation is associated with worse outcomes, but this is probably just a small subset of uh, uh, the patients. Similar study from uh, almost 20 years ago looked at lectin pathway components. They looked at mannose binding lectin, um, the phycolins, and then uh, C4 and other um, uh, lectin pathway proteins. And similar to the uh, study I just told you about, what the authors found is that yes, these proteins are associated with worse disease, but they were really only detectable in a subset of patients, about 25% of the patients. So it does look like in some patients you have classical and lectin pathway activation, but this does not appear to be a universal driver of disease. So you don't need to have um, those proteins present. Of course, you could have alternative pathway activation explaining the, the rest of the patients who have C3 deposits. What is the evidence that this is um, associated with worse outcomes? Um, well, there's a lot of evidence um, showing that complement activation does associate with worse outcomes in IgA nephropathy. What's interesting is that traditionally, we don't think of it as a disease that has low C3 levels in the circulation. This is a table that many of you have seen showing that if you look for normal or abnormal complement levels, um, how does that change your differential diagnosis? And the traditional teaching has been that um, Ig or C3 levels are normal in IgA nephropathy. So a lot of people don't really think of it as a complement-driven disease. But what's interesting is that if you do look at all patients, there is a subset that does have low C3 levels, supporting the fact that there's a greater um, degree of complement activation in these patients, and they also um, end up having worse outcomes. So here's a study looking at serum three, uh, C3 levels. The lower the C3 level, the more C3 appears to be in the glomerulus, consistent with the idea that the C3 levels are low because they're being consumed within the kidney. And then if you look at the circulating C3 levels or the glomerular C3 levels, in both cases where you have greater consumption of complement, lower circulating levels or greater deposition within the glomeruli, you appear to have worse um, kidney outcomes and a lower probability of kidney survival. So again, if we go back to our simple uh, complement cascade, it looks like we have some classical pathway activation in a subset of patients, some lectin pathway activation in a subset of patients, probably alternative pathway activation in the remaining patients. Um, clearly, you can have involvement of all three um, pathways. Yet we're still left with this, this possibility that complement activation is a consequence of the tissue injury, and none of these association studies prove that it's the cause of, uh, of kidney injury. Now, I want to digress and just talk about a number, uh, another part of the complement system, these factor H-related proteins. 
And many of you will not have even heard of these proteins. It may seem a little bit of uh, obscure, but there are some interesting associations, particularly between these proteins and IgA nephropathy. So in addition to the activation cascades, there is this important complement regulator called factor H, which is this long string-like protein that floats around in serum, but can bind to surfaces and regulate the alternative pathway on those surfaces. Now, factor H is also associated with five factor H-related proteins that probably arose through reduplication of this uh, gene. These proteins also float around and are not believed to be complement regulators, but are actually believed to be antagonists of factor H, competing with it for binding the surfaces, leading to greater alternative pathway activation. And they may do this by um, competing with factor H, and some people actually think that they directly bind to surfaces and bring in complement and activate it on those surfaces, kind of like immunoglobulins. Now, why would we even think about these proteins in relation to IgA nephropathy? The reason is that a number of really unbiased studies, including a GWAS uh, published um, over 10 years ago, have identified factor H-related proteins as being um, abnormal, uh, or, or I should say associated with the onset of disease and the severity of disease. So this first study showed that the deletion of these factor H-related proteins appear to be protective from IgA nephropathy. So if these are complement activating proteins, as I just outlined, then deletion of them appears to be uh, protective. So based on this evidence, people have had a strong interest in using complement inhibitory drugs to treat IgA nephropathy. Because there are so many drugs that are uh, becoming available for this, the next question is, how do we fit these drugs into our treatment approach for these patients? This is a uh, figure in a recent paper, kind of breaking down the different treatments into different uh, mechanistic categories. So we have some sort of generalized protective drugs like RAS inhibitors and SGLT2 inhibitors, and complement inhibitors probably are not overlapping with the effects of these drugs. We also have a number of drugs that work upstream of complement, perhaps reducing the production of the galactose-deficient IgA1 or the autoantibodies against it. These drugs target B cells um, or um, uh, adaptive immune cells. Here, too, what we are looking at with complement is probably downstream of all of these drugs. So complement inhibitors really fit in this other bucket. It more directly blocks inflammation in the glomerulus as the downstream consequence of the um, uh, production of the galactose-deficient IgA1 and the autoantibodies to that IgA. So going back to our complement cascade, we can ask the question of where would we optimally block this cascade to prevent the, um, the inflammation in the glomerulus? Now, fortunately, there are a number of new anti-complement drugs that are either um, in the clinic or in clinical trials, and they really allow us to pick which portion of the cascade we would like to block. There are drugs that specifically block the classical lectin or alternative pathways, drugs that block at the level of C3, which would presumably block all complement activation, irrespective of how the system was activated. And then there are even drugs that block quite specific uh, downstream fragments, such as C5A. Uh, C5A. And the question is, which of these is best suited for treating uh, IgA nephropathy? Um, just going back to this, as, as we've discussed, classical pathway and lectin pathway are involved in the disease, but are fear be really only um, activated in a subset of patients, which might lead us more towards the drugs that block either the alternative pathway or um, one of these central nodes of the system. I want to talk about just a couple of these drugs that um, look fairly interesting. One is this new drug, which is an siRNA against C5, not just blocking C5, but actually preventing the body from producing it. And some uh, early results were published earlier this uh, year in C. Jason, and it looks quite interesting. If you look at proteinuria as a readout, you get a sustained reduction in proteinuria with um, this uh, um, C5 inhibition. Uh, and so this appears to be effective for IgA nephropathy. And the authors also showed that hematuria um, is reduced in almost all of the patients treated consistent with the idea that if you prevent production of C5, you are reducing glomerular inflammation. lnp 3 is another interesting drug. This is an oral agent that is a direct alternative pathway inhibitor 
as we've gone over, um, it appears that the alternative pathway is the predominant activation pathway. So this might selectively block the mechanism of activation in a disease like IgA nephropathy. These are the results of a phase two study showing um, uh, based on higher doses, you get a reduction in proteinuria. And a phase three study has been, results from it have been presented at meetings. It is not yet published, but it should be coming out soon. And the early reports are that um, this drug is effective in IgA nephropathy. So again, this will be an interesting new drug that we will have um, available, uh, presumably in the near future. There are some other drugs in uh, phase two trials. Some of them, uh, this factor D inhibitor um, should block the alternative pathway, uh, C5 inhibitor blocking downstream complement activation, and then this interesting agent that blocks both the downstream terminal complement activation and then also provides some alternative pathway inhibition um, uh, may be well suited for blocking the pathologic um, events that occur in IgA nephropathy. Now, of course, what are the risks of complement inhibition? The, the major risk is uh, probably an increased risk of infection. And you can infer this from the fact that patients with congenital deficiencies in complement proteins are at increased risk of uh, bacterial infections with encapsulated organisms. The um, results of these studies um, show that the drugs appear to be really um, quite safe. Uh, in general, um, the studies include vaccination against the high-risk organisms, and then in some cases, they allow prophylactic antibiotics. Here are some summaries from the uh, two studies I referred to, the lmp 023 study, where they really did not see any risk signal. In this uh, study, patients were vaccinated. And then in the uh, Samdir uh, Disaran study, patients were vaccinated and uh, providers were allowed to use antibiotics. And again, um, the results with the drug were quite similar to placebo, and there was really no risk signal. So this is a um, certainly a concern with these drugs that you will increase the patient's risk of infection but we are not seeing a major risk um, um, based on those studies. So then the last question is, how do we fit these drugs in with the other um, drugs that are available? This is a, a diagram that I actually um, uh, uh, made for more conventional um, immune complex glomerulonephritis, where you have a loss of tolerance, activation of T cells, but it makes the same point as is probably occurs in IgA nephropathy, where the deposition of uh, immune complexes in the glomerulus it's really a downstream uh, mediator of injury. Complement activation is a downstream occurrence, and it's probably only one of several uh, mediators of injury. So if we think about how complement inhibitors fit into the treatment approach for these patients, they probably need to be used in combination with other drugs, such as B-cell targeted drugs, which are going to block the production of these um, um, either the uh, aberrant IgA or the autoantibodies, but this may still have a, an important role in quickly blocking inflammation within the glomerulus while you're waiting for these other upstream uh, drugs to work. On the other hand, it's unlikely that complement inhibitors are curative in the sense that they're not really stopping the pathologic process that caused the disease in the first place, but of course, rapid cessation of inflammation could be critically important. So I'll end by going back to the initial polling question. When you detect glomerular C3 deposits in biopsies from patients with IgA nephropathy, these are not rarely seen. They're almost universally present. I think this is true to true. This is due to true activation, not just passive trapping of the protein. It is true for um, IgA nephropathy as well as vasculitis, but it is prognostically important in that the greater the amount of C3 that you have deposited, the worse the prognosis appears to be. So in conclusion, the complement system is almost always activated within the glomeruli of patients with IgA nephropathy. Activation probably occurs through the alternative pathway, except in a subset of patients. And there is uh, published evidence that the classical and lectin pathway, um, when it is um, activated, is associated with worse disease. Uh, complement inhibitory drugs block a part of the immune system that really, really is not directly affected by other immunomodulatory drugs like rituximab or, or MMF. Complement inhibitory drugs are currently being tested in clinical trials with IgA nephropathy, and the early reports show that these drugs are uh, effective in this disease, and likely these drugs will be available in the near future and will be part of our, our treatment approach to this disease. Here are some uh, additional readings and resources uh, that discuss the role of complement in this disease. Thank you very much.